Hello everybody, um, I'm Yvonne Miller, Professor of Design Psychology and Director of the QUT Design Lab. I just want to pop in this little introduction before you see the video that we did yesterday from yesterday's seminar on creating great places and a focus on child brain design. Unfortunately, um, we were hacked and never had Zoom hacking done before actually and heard of it and never really experienced it. And I really want to apologize to everybody who was exposed to that and I'm sorry that we um, we probably were slower to, to end the meeting than, than we should have been because we just had no idea what was going on. So I just want to um, apologise, particularly to people who were offended by some of those comments, as we would rightly be offended because those are abhorrent. Uh, they do not represent at all anything that we think about or, or believe. And um, it's just me personally, it's actually really disappointing that there are people out there in the world that first off have the time to do this and secondly would be um, spreading such hate language. That's just against everything that we do. So I'm really sorry um, that you were exposed to that as a participant in one of our seminars. Um, it's shooken us, shooken, shaked us, <laughs> whatever the right word is for that. Um, but it has also made me really, um, well, of course we're gonna put a number of steps in to make sure that we know how to handle these situations uh, better again in the future. And it has also, reunited the, this passion that I have that we actually need to be having and leading these critical dialogues about you know how we should live as citizens and how we can create great places and make I hope, a positive impact on the world so that people don't feel the need to be wasting their time with stupid stunts like we saw yesterday so it's really important that we come together and move past that and so to that end uh, we've got the recording here for the three quarters the majority of the seminar where we had a wonderful conversation after we got over um, this hijacking, uh, we had a wonderful conversation about how can we create child-friendly places and how can we design for children and what lens do we need to put on. So um, I encourage you to engage with that and to engage with us and continue the conversation because next week we'll be talking, flipping the lens and talking about age-friendly inclusive design. And so before I get into, uh, before I hand over to Deb and she continues the presentation, let me just again uh, acknowledge the terrible Nagra people as the First Nation owners of the land where QT now stands and pay my respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. I recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning uh, and I acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QT community. And with no further ado, here's a seminar on child-friendly places. Welcome back everyone. Um, so we're going to start basically where we left off um, and I'm just going to basically go through the rest of the theories and then I'm handing over to Tobias who's going to talk about um, some of his work and some and playable design, child friendly design. So where was I? So I think I was in um, place attachment. So place attachment theory basically explains why people develop emotional bonds with specific places. And those places are often um, memories from childhood or treasured landscapes from childhood. We often have attachments to that. Um, and so understanding how people develop or why people develop attachments to a place can really aid in the creation of better places that people will use and enjoy and take ownership of and thrive in. And so one of the reasons why we want people to adapt uh, to kind of develops a sense of place attachment is actually then they're more likely to care for an environment and to, um, to have ownership over it and actually be willing to change it. Then we have sense of place theory, which is, is the concept that every environment has a unique character um, that's inherent to it and um, which people can really identify and be intrigued by. And this sense of place, or we often say genius loci, um, this really should be the starting point of a design, ensuring that the unique character is not um, lost or hidden, but it's actually celebrated and reinforced. Then we have personal space, and we're all kind of focused on personal space right now, especially in the, the pandemic, and we've been thinking a lot about more about personal space. Um, but the idea is, so this idea of proxemics, that's um, the study of personal space and really how different people conceptualize, use, organize space. Um, and it really explains how the different levels of intimate, personal, social, public distances and how those may different, de differ depending on a person's characteristics. So women may have a different sense of personal space 
um, than men, or um, specifically for this uh, webinar, children may have a different sense of personal space because children often come up very close to you. Um, they don't have that same um, personal space bubble that adults do. And then finally, biophilic design. And that's the idea that humans have evolved with nature and we have a preference uh, for being with li other living things, including plants and animals. So access to nature in today's fast paced, overstimulating over urban environment is critical for stress reduction and attention restoration. So there's actually a lot of theory to say um, that being in natural spaces is actually good for our health and well-being. So that'll do it for the six theories. I'm going to hand it over now to Tobias um, to talk about child-friendly design that develops. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Deb, and welcome all. Thanks for zooming in and um, yeah, appreciate it that you're all listening in for the second session of uh, child-friendly design. Obviously, that's where we are very passionate about as urban play and uh, as a play consultant. So before I share some ideas, just a quick intro about myself and urban play. Let's see here. So yeah, I'm Tobias Wolbert. I'm a landscape architect. I studied in Hanover in Germany, came to Australia in 2006, started in the play industry in 2011 and started the Seven Senses Foundation in 2013, really raising awareness about inclusive play beyond accessibility. So how can we create spaces that are engaging for all people with sensory processing disorder, autism, but by engaging within the Seven Senses, we make environments more enjoyable for all, if you have an impairment or not, because that's how we all engage with our built environment. So that's how we experience it through our senses. Urban play, that here we are. Our passion is obviously child-friendly design and it's really leaving a legacy for the next generation. So every playground needs to be a destination. So we are challenging the status quo. Boring is banished and we really want to really work with the design theories as um, Deb mentioned before as well on every single project so that it is really a wow for the community, that it encourages the community to stay a long time and that they can develop and learn. So we as Urban Play, we are a design and construct company and really have a total solution. So we design the playgrounds, water parks, skate, shade, rubber. We can do everything that has to do with the play environment. So really engage in this full recreational precinct. Here's my, one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, plays the highest form of research. And I really like that because like sometimes play, we think it's all for kids, but it's actually for all of us. And there's so much like research as well, how important play is for adults as well. And again, child-friendly design means not just that the child can be safe and playable within that public space or open space, it's actually for all of us. And what I love about play is a research thing because research a lot of times, it's not about finding an answer. Sometimes it's like raising a question and through the research, another question comes out. So it's evolving and developing all the way through. So with that, I guess one of the most important gift, gifts we can give our kids is obviously play time. So, and when you see some of this, this figures, 90% of the child's brain development happens before the age of five. So again, like how can we engage our kids from a very early stage? To, to, to play, to socialize, to communicate, and to develop through this phase. And then the 10% of the brain develops after five, but it's still important all the way through to your elderly ages as well. A few benefits of play when we design our spaces. So the motor skill is important, language, social skills, and enhance the self-regulation, curiosity, cognitive, flexible creativity. So all of that is a lot of stuff that we know, but it's again, how do we bring playable environments within the built environment, not just in parks or not just in the childcare centers. So how do we actually fill the spaces in between these um, destinations? Again, I, I mentioned that in the last um, webinar as well, when we design our space, like let's, let's say in a, in a school environment, a lot of times it's about physical education. Yes, it's important and we have to engage with physical development of it, but we still have to look at the social benefits, the cognitive benefits, the emotional and the creative. So 
it's, it's really creating a multi affordance space that captures all of these. Playgrounds are not just places you can design on a code computer screen and push into mass production. I think that again goes for, for playground. We, we, we really need to understand child-friendly design and it needs to be backed up by research. So we are quite fortunate that we have the Compen Play Institute as one of our partners with Compen. They are in Berlin, in Germany, which is fantastic. And actually they have a whole team that does research on the equipment, on the benefits, how it actually is age appropriate, how the kids can engage with the space, where they can socialize, where they can do the physical um, um, education. Like all of these things are not just, oh, this is a beautiful play structure. Now it's actually evidence behind it why we put the, um, the, the handle here and the, and the climbing bar on this side and what materials we used as well. And we as Urban Play are very committed to research as well and to evidence-based design and have a lot of collaboration through the seven cents through myself as well with QT. I think I'm a guest lecturer now since five or six years with Deb and people in place and, and really enjoy that. And I think we learn so much through this collaboration of um, academia and practice. And then actually looking back at some of the, the um, spaces that that we designed and built go like hey what has worked what hasn't worked and how can we improve it and how can we develop it further and further and give more evidence to our clients as well to say well this is why we are doing it it's not just to leave a beautiful picture here now this is actually all the benefits that the community everybody within the community will have so this quote from professor klaus schwab we are living in an ever increasing urban world with more children growing up in cities than ever before it is imperative that we design and build cities that meet the needs of children and i think there are some amazing i guess um, um thought provocations out there already there's this company from gil panalosa 880 cities so if we design a city for an eight and an eight year old we actually create a city for all but um it's challenging to think about that if, if so many families and, and the population so much in, in cities like where is the green space and how can we actually maximize the green space to make it more and more playable and I think that goes back to the change that we have from the planning scheme a lot of times we go like well if we want to have a playground it needs to be in a park and then we have yes pocket parks local parks district parks destination parks but how can we actually do the intro how can we make our footpath playable how can we make a bus shelter playable? How can we make our plazas more playable? And I think that's really where we need to be to make sure that our children have an opportunity wherever they grow up in a very dense community or in a very dense cityscape to still experience this idea of playfulness and engagement. So here's a really nice little um, diagram from uh, Natalia uh, Krizyak from Designing Child-Friendly Compact Cities. And I love that. And a lot of times it's like you see here, people play at home, in the house or in their garden, then there's nothing, they go to a playground. Here in Australia, 99% of the people drive there. So you drive to the playground, you play there, you jump back into the car and jump back into the house, you go through your electric garage, that nobody of your neighbors can see you and yeah, you have a beautiful time here. Or you go to an organized sports, like nearly every day. Well, there's soccer and then there's Batman and then there's this and piano. Or you go to school where you have a little bit of physical education within your play environment and the oval, but nothing in between. So when we look at this model, it's um, actually, I grew up in Germany in a, in a play street. So actually that street is a shared street. It has um, um, cobble as a surface and the, the cars are allowed to drive through it with 5Ks but then we were all playing in the streets. So it's like this connectivity, this, grid, this human corridor. So how do we make sure that the space between the home and the playground and the organized sport and the school is all playable? So how can we actually develop this nooks that engage and, and, and provide a safe space where I can do that? So really passionate about that and, and, and looking at ideas, how we can get the risk. I think that's, that's the biggest, biggest um, fear that everybody has. Well, if I do that on my street, like, is it then my responsibility if a child falls on my, in front of my house because I did something, then, then I get sued. So how do we actually break these barriers, make it safe, but playable all the way through? So playable urban design is another research we're looking at at the moment with QUT as well. 
to and and we see that all over the world it's it, it, it's happening already i was not last year the year before i was in the netherlands and i was waiting for the train and there was a trampoline and there was a big swing set so i was waiting for the train for an hour i was hanging out with some youngsters there i met them there was a little skate park so it was not in a park it was not in a designated area for play it was actually part of the urban infrastructure and i think there's some amazing opportunities how we can create these little nooks within Brisbane, within all the different cities in Australia to really engage a playful connectivity. Another big challenge we have in, our, in the world, not only in Australia, is loneliness. So if we again create things like this here, like you are on a swing set and you actually meet another person, so there's an opportunity to connect in a playful way because I, I always love it when I go with my kids to a different country where they don't speak the language. Through play, they actually make friends. They connect. They don't actually understand each other when they're talking, but they actually play the same games. They play tech or they interfere with different things. So it's the same for us as adults. I think these things would lift and, and break these barriers of, oh, this is person can actually sit next to him or, or, or how do I connect? And then comes to this idea of when I started in 2013 with the idea of Seven Senses Street. So as I said, the passion was to create inclusive places or destinations where everybody can gather but one th big thing is streetscapes like streetscapes are huge within our neighborhoods and they're not utilized they're really designed just for the cars so it's not pedestrian first bicycle seconds car third it's cars first second and third so the idea was with the seven cents at the thought provocation hey, how can we turn our our um, front yard or our streetscape into a seven cents activation and this was in Tuong done by Gaima Bailey, for example, to activate the street, the community got together and really engaged with different, like let's smell, balancing, painting, like, like the fence lines. And then people all over Australia did it. Like we gave a little guide, hey, here are some ideas what you can do. And um, there's some guidance as well, how you can get an approval from different councils. But a lot of times people actually did it even on their own property, so in your front yard. So I think that's a great opportunity to just engage with your neighbors or in your community to make a change tomorrow if you wanted to do that. So with that, um, there's a little challenge that we put out there for all of you, and you only have one week. So till next week, how can you, um, how can your front yard become more playful? Because I think that's really your own property. You don't have to go through council to get approval. So it could be that you actually paint some um, hopscotches on your driveway that you actually put some pot plants out at the front and you make a meandering um, sensory um, pathway with different smells and different textures so come up with a few ideas take and, and, and do it over the weekend send us some photos we will pick our favorite one or the or the winner and Deb and um, Yvonne mentioned that they're happy to give a free book for a great initiative so I think it's, it's something that all of us that are now listening could do on the weekend and we make a little contribution towards a more child-friendly um, urban space which is our own neighborhood and with this i give back now to dad um, and, and and again i just showed like your design theory storming when i read this book this was the first thing i did on monday with the team here we did like a coffee break poster and all of the people that work at urban play have that in front of their um, desk so every design when we are finished we actually have a coffee together we all love coffee we are all addicts and we actually review the design and we go like hey have we really looked at the affordance theory what how can we improve that how can this sandstone boulder be more than just the retaining how can this bench be more than just the seating space so all these things it's just like a very beautiful thought provocation for us to make sure our designs have all of these things captured Sometimes they don't, but then we can take it as a reverse brief to go back to our client and say, hey, look, so that I think there's a few things missing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sense of place? Like, what is the narrative we really want to promote here? So, and back over to you now, Deb. Thank you. Thanks, Tobias. That was awesome. Really good. It's always so exciting to see all your, the photos that you have and kind of the exciting work that you've done. So I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so thank you, Tobias. And now I'm going to talk about child friendly design um, as the global priority. So, why did we choose this and what it means and what we actually, um, what we need to think about when we're designing child friendly spaces? 
So I'd like to start with this little um, idea, and this is for real. Um, so something that, there's something called the mosquito device. And obviously it, it's called the mosquito device because it's this high pitched noise that um, it's, they call it the anti-loitering sound device, an ultrasonic teenage deterrent. So it was actually originally designed for prisons, which might tell you something about what it is. Um, so councils and places like Philadelphia have actually put this into place in public spaces. Um, so to actually deter specifically youth um, from gathering or from doing things if they think they're hanging out or doing bad things or vandalizing. So they're actually trying to um, get them to leave that space. So, and this, this is, the quote is actually from their website. So it's a high pitched, high frequency sound that deters loitering by being unbelievably annoying to the point where kids cannot stay in the area. So not only is this strange, but it's, it's, it's also quite um, alarming because it's, it's unethical. It discriminates against an age group. And it's actually not necessarily, um, it, it actually doesn't discriminate amongst children. So it's actually, even though it's targeting children or young people who are causing issues or loitering or vandalizing, um, it's actually something that all children hear. So some of the problems with this, not only is it unethical, but um, there's been reports where a man who is 25 can still hear it. So as we age, we, can hear, we can't hear the high pitched sounds as much. Um, but somebody as old as 25 can still hear these. Um, we also, it also says that um, babies or really young kids who actually can't communicate when they're hearing something or are uncomfortable, they might be hearing this. So there's lots of issues with this in general, but as you can see, this was a, a, a news article and it was just 2019, so relatively recently, um, park officials were criticized for installing these devices. So the, I, I like to show this just because one, it's alarming and two, um, it shows that we really do still need to think about how we're making sure our spaces are designed for everyone, especially young people. So child friendly design, I mean, it must be, it must include and think about quite a lot of things, but three things that that I like to think about are that it considers children's characteristics. So um, their physical characteristics, their developmental characteristics, um, how they think, how they play, what they need to do. So it thinks about them as being different from adults. It also supports children as whole people. So now and into the future, I think one of the things I often hear is, oh yeah, we have to think about children because they're our future. Well, actually, they're really important now. They're a population that we actually need to think about when they're children. So including them in processes, decision-making, um, making sure that they're cared for, and all the things that Tobias talked about, about you know their brains are developing. So we actually th need to think about kids now while they're still kids. And then child-friendly design must really address all developmental stages. So it's not just the younger kids, even though up to five is critical. I think there's that middle childhood and often teenagers um, get forgotten in public space or just like the mosquito device, we actually think they're causing trouble if they're gathering and socializing. But we have to remember that socializing is such a critical aspect of becoming an adult or becoming you know, a well-rounded human being. So we need to give young people the opportunities to socialize, especially in public space, because that's where they meet their friends. So child-friendly design has quite a significant policy context. And a lot of times we're doing stuff, designers can make decisions, but we have to remember that there is sort of a, um, a policy framework that we, that there, um, is present and is kind of incorporating some of these ideas into different um, networks and frameworks and um, kind of recommendations. So the first that some of you may know about is the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So Australia has um, ratified this. And it's actually one of the most widely, rapidly ratified treaties in history. Um, so it basically addresses all children under the age of 18 um, and gives them basic human rights for living, working, and playing. Then there's the UNICEF Child Friendly Cities Framework. And again, this is a policy framework that um, different cities around the world, so it's an international framework, um, they can sign on to and be part of and use some of their recommendations and guides and it really, um, it the, 
the critical thing about it is that it's about the city as much as it is about the child. So it's about the context. So it talks about ensuring we have safe, secure, clean environments with access to green space. It specifically mentions um, giving kids opportunities or places where they can meet their friends and play. And then also having their opinion heard and being able to participate in community life. So all of those things, as well as just having a safe, secure, clean water, fresh air, um, you know, free from danger place to grow up. They're all important into, in a child-friendly city. And then lastly, I wanna mention, um, is just the Growing Up in Cities program. And if you know Kevin Lynch, who is a pretty famous American uh, planner, um, in the 1970s, he actually developed this uh, program, Growing Up in Cities, and it was later uh, reprised by Louise Chala, who's an environmental psychologist, and she's currently in Colorado. Um, and this program actually really um, used participatory methods, so engaged children in community decisions, used different activities like mapping, digital storytelling, photo voice, um, walking tours, to really understand what kids think and prioritize their opinions and their voices in, in the decision making. So what I'm going to do now is just talk about several key aspects of child-friendly design, going, not obviously covering everything. And then, so I'm just going to do this before I go into theory storming and we're going to use an urban park or a park as the scenario. So as Tobias actually mentioned this idea of independent mobility. So, you know, kids oftentimes get driven everywhere. But um, if you think about it, young people, they don't drive themselves. So if places are far away, that makes it difficult. Um, and they don't have money for Ubers or taxis or things, so they have to take public transportation. So we have to think about how accessible places are that kids want to get to. So opportunities for independent mobility really need to be safe, accessible, affordable, and efficient. So it doesn't, you know, if it, it takes two hours on the bus to get across town if they're not going into the CBD. So that's problematic. So that's oftentimes why either they don't go or their parents have to drive. So it's important to think about those things. And then also going places by themselves really increases agency, confidence, the knowledge of their city, um, and wayfinding skills. And I think that the wayfinding skills is really important because it helps us understand how to negotiate and maneuver and figure out where we are in the world. Um, and I think actually now that we use our phones with maps, Google Maps and um, the GPS so much, we're losing some of our wayfinding skills in general, like that's everybody. So I think for kids, it's especially important for them to understand how do they how do they read the landscape? How do they read the city? How do they understand where they are and what to look for? So there's actually a global street design guide and they have a specific one on designing streets for kids. And this is just a, one of the pages. So uh, streets for kids should be safe and healthy, comfortable and convenient and inspirational and educational. Um, and I put the website down below, but um, a lot of different groups have thought about how we can make sure a, a street is designed so that kids can actually use it just as much as cars or adults or anybody else, any other user group. And then actually Tobias mentioned this as well. So this idea of home zones or when our, I'm not gonna try to say it in German, I'll let him say it. Um, but basically prioritizing pedestrians within a shared space. Um, with the vehicles. So it, it's not having the cars be number one, it's actually prioritizing the pedestrians. And so some design features are visible entrances, physical barriers, uh, shared and paved spaces, but also landscaped areas, street furniture, integrated uses, and then human scale spaces. Um, so those are all the types of um, design features or design characteristics that we can incorporate into um, these shared zones. Okay, so the next key aspect is per personal health and safety and just a few things um, just to think about. Obviously, there's a lot, but um, I mean, we all think that, you know, children are smaller. So that's sort of the first thing we think about. Um, they have less agility, body awareness, and physical strength. So we have to make sure that the things that we, the opportunities that we afford in the environment um, take into consideration those specific physical 
abilities. But then it's also important to remember that young people are more susceptible to environmental toxins and pollutants. So they have a less developed immune, immune system. So this is just the pictures here are showing, you know, spraying herbicide in gardens or in the grass. Um, and then it's interesting. So there was a whole movement about making sure that um, toxic herbicides were not sprayed um, in parks in different areas where kids were playing because, you know, they're, they're close to the ground. They're putting things in their mouths. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot and we're thinking a lot about that now with COVID-19, but I think there's other toxic um, elements in the environment and pollutants that we have to pay attention to too and they've been around for a while and so we need to we need to be very careful when we're designing a child-friendly space that um, we're not using those and then finally cognitive and social awareness is still developing so obviously personal safety is a consideration um, but not to overdo it so that um, you know stranger danger um, is something that actually has become not necessarily, it hasn't become more dangerous. It's just that the media has portrayed it more and that we hear about it more. And so um, again, perception of danger or perception of safety is almost just as important as the actual safety of a space. So things to consider definitely. And then I'm not gonna go too much into play because Tobias talked a lot about play, but um, I like to think that, you know, the importance of play is really the physical development, cognitive development, social development, and those are the three we usually talk about. But I also like to think about creativity development and that, um, you know, play is allowing us to explore. And so, you know, adults can play just as much as kids can play. And those are some of the ways we really kind of come up with great ideas or just learn about things. So I think it's, it's good for play to address all of those. And then I want to share this because, um, you know, obviously in Australia, uh, we have a certain standard of living in places like America or, or other places around the world. Um, but it's important to remember in developing countries, um, we have to think about the context and what is still needed. So we still have to think about the developmental tasks and, you know, kids making sure that they have independent mobility and things like that. So not, none of that changes, except the context is very specific and we have to pay attention to that. So this is from Indonesia. Um, Yvonne and I have a PhD student, um, Fitri. And so these are child-friendly public spaces, or arbitraries is what they're, they're referred to. And they afford opportunities to learn about traditional games and cultural heritage. And so these are some of the cultural games that uh, kids are playing and the traditional games. So it's really, again, it's play, but it's actually um, allowing opportunities for maybe cognitive development or physical development here. Um, so it's thinking about that um, in a broader context. And then finally, um, intergenerational design. Um, this is really important because obviously right now we have, um, you know, we want to design for all ages and all abilities, but many times we have grandparents who care for grandkids. We have older siblings who care for younger siblings. Um, we have, we want to encourage social engagement across the generations. And there's multiple reasons for this. There's not only sharing cultural awareness, sharing traditions. Um, one group can teach the other group. And I think that the benefit, um, it's actually not going just one direction. So a lot of times we hear that the older groups, the older generation can teach the younger generation about work ethic and how to do things physically or, you know, whatever it is, but then the younger generation can actually teach, um, you know, computer skills or something like that. So around the world, there are some examples of facilities where they're combining youth with aged care facilities or daycares with um, like daycare centers with aged care, um, retirement homes, things like that. Uh, but it still doesn't happen very often. And so I think we need to actually do a little bit more to encourage intergenerational spaces that really afford opportunities for, for all ages. And we have to be very specific about that. Okay, so now I'm gonna use theory storming. Um, and we've chosen a, an urban park or a park basically um, as the scenario. And mostly because that's a very child, it's thought of as a very child-friendly space that children often use um, parks or playgrounds. So, 
Oh, yeah, that's okay. We're all good now, so you can, I've got to leave at 3.15 anyway. Okay. Okay, so, um, so if you remember from last week, we, I showed a chart of theory storming. Um, so this is basically, we take the six theories that I talked about, I talked about some with the first, <laughs> the, um, well, we talked about all of them last week, but um, so affordance theory, prospect refuge, personal space, all of these. Um, so then taking them in the scenario of a park. So simple park signage that kids can read, has symbols that they understand. It's not difficult, it's very clear. Um, it might be at a good height. So thinking about sight lines and, and where you actually place the signage. Um, it might have child size um, site furniture. So making sure it's not all really high or you know things that are actually not only accommodating their physical abilities, but are also um, engaging and they're actually intriguing so kids want to use them and then I won't go through all of these but prospect refuge theory so um, a hill you could manufacture a hill, you could create a hill or you could you know take advantage of a hill that's already there but that's something that could enable adult observation so kids playing down at a lower area or towers and tree houses where um, children can see without being seen, if you remember that's the, the prospect refuge kind of tagline. So then we just go through each of those, um, each of those different theories and think about how it can be applied to a specific site or a park in this case. So then I want to just show this is actually um, Huntington Rise Park in the city of Gold Coast and is actually designed um, RPS and Urban Play did this. Um, so I just thought it would, it's a good example. Um, so I want to just show basically how you can even use theory storming to evaluate an existing space. So ideally we'd use it from the front end and um, kind of think about how we design spaces right off the bat before we've even started. Um, but you can also actually use it to evaluate spaces and, and see maybe what improvements need to happen or how well they're working. So just some examples and obviously this is only one view of the park. So it has a lot more to do, um, a lot more different aspects of it. But you can think, it's hard to see, but Prospect Refuge, there's this little tower, little area, so kids can climb up there, they can get a great view, and they can be slightly hidden from view, although you can, there's slats so you can still see them. Um, but they might have that sense of safety up there. So that's an, uh, that's an example of Prospect Refuge. Affordance theory, um, you know, with opportunities because of the shade structure. So when it gets hot, you've actually created a space. It's, it's sort of that visual cue that says it's gonna be cool under there. I can play on a really hot sunny day under those spaces. Personal space, you have some um, little um, kind of different size, I don't know, stumps or kind of rocks. I'm not sure what material they are. Um, seats, so different kids can seat on them. There's also benches, or, or, in different places and different types of benches. So that's really nice for personal space. Um, sense of place, so different vegetation that's used or different materials. I mean, one of the easiest ways to incorporate sense of place or genius loci is just using native materials. And then it, it actually shows where you are in the world and gives you that sense of place. Uh, place attachment, that's actually, um, it looks like a, a a parent and a child and the swing together. And so again, it's, it's opportunities to build those memories. Um, it's also, you know, slightly residential area. So it seems like a place they might come to on a frequent or frequently building those memories. And then finally biophilic design. And so having views of and incorporating natural elements. So the plants within the space, but also um, really kind of celebrating the views of the adjacent vegetation. So this is just a few of the um, different theories applied into that design. And then this is this is a, an older park. Obviously, this is um, completely different. <laughs> this is actually in Chelmer. But, um, you know, I, I like to look at different spaces like this and redesign them in my head. I don't know if other designers do that, <laughs> but I always do that. Um, so a couple, you know, I mean, it's got some trees, green grass. So yeah, you could maybe say biophilic design, although it doesn't really celebrate it. Um, affordances, sure, there's tr shade structures and things, um, things to do, but again, limited. But really, it doesn't necessarily strike me as having a great sense of place or having incorporated 
um, local materials, things like that, or even having a, a sense of um, the design, a specific theme, anything. Um, place attachment. I mean, you may incorporate that because if it's in a neighborhood and people might use it regularly, but I hardly see people here, so I'm not sure. Um, prospect refuge, there's not a lot of spaces where they get prospect refuge. Um, and then personal space. Again, it's just very wide open. There's one bench. Um, it doesn't really accommodate um, different um, kind of personal space bubbles or even allowing multiple people to be in the space because there's only one bench. So it's good to kind of think through sort of how you would be able to improve this space based on the different theories and what that really means. So that's basically it. So for more information, um, you can go to our uh, book. There, we have a link, and I think Yvonne uh, put a link to um, in the chat. And I'll hand it over to Vaughn just to um, kind of wrap us up. So thanks, Deb, and thanks, Tobias. Um, despite the disastrous start, once again, I apologize. Um, I think we got back on track really quickly, and we've really had a great um, conversation and thought about what might uh, be going on when we think about creating great places that are for children, um, and we know how important it is. Uh, so next week, we're going to continue on and talk about age-friendly, inclusive design. So some of the things Tobias mentioned about the 880 communities um, and intergenerational playgrounds will come through there, but we're actually going to talk more broadly about disability and ability and inclusion, um, and in the following week, sustainability. But what we want to do now, Deb, is have a bit of a conversation. Um, I promised that I wasn't going to throw you under the bus again in terms of asking you hard questions, but um, it's not me that asked me asked them, it's the great audience. And the, and the question is, um, what? where are some great examples of good intergenerational public facilities, whether it's a playground or public space? Like, are there some really um, good examples of that? And Tobias, you might know of some, um, or we, are we still kind of in the infancy um, and we need to develop a database of those? Well, I think a good example is uh, South Bank. I think South Bank is really in, engaging for all and, and yeah. nothing is segregated, so everything really flows nicely together. Um, also, Kershaw Gardens is a great example in Rockhampton, I reckon. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's maybe a couple of mentioned there. What about you, Deb? Some other ones? Yeah, South Bank is one of my favorites. Um, so I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think there's, there's newer parks. Um, I mean, I kind of focus on parks, but um, I think Brew Park, actually, with intergenerational, it's not only... Um, it's not only parents and kids, but it's it because it's geared toward a youth age group rather than a young children age group. There is stuff for young children, but I think that's also nice because then it gives um, multiple um, age ranges opportunities to do things, and they you know it has multiple um, activities going on with the tennis center, and then there's like a little cafe and things like that. So I think that's pretty well designed in terms of. Um, Kind of intergenerational aspects of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a few other feedbacks here. Tyree, would they, what, can you say the name of the one, the second one you mentioned as well? Kershaw Gardens. Kershaw Gardens in Rockhampton. Okay. okay. And then, yeah. I think it's, it, it's really about, because um, I think multi-generational parks, we have a lot of them. So it's like, but it, it's this fragmentation. What I found is a lot of times, and that goes back to the planning scheme maybe a little bit as well, where we say, uh, here's a toddler playground, is this for teenagers the only thing is really a half basketball course and that's really it so again for teenage girls it's really challenging as well like how how, how do we um address that they don't want to be seen on a playground but they still obviously need this physical engagement as well and connectivity so again i think yeah south bank is fantastic for that because like really doesn't matter what age like there's something really beautiful the powerhouse i think the precinct around the powerhouse is really really nice as well because it's all nestled within um, nature and, yeah. and really about the characteristics of of um, of Brisbane and the sense of loci there as well. And, um, but I think that the other idea is as well to get more fitness closer to the play facilities. And I know there are some challenges again with standards because like when the kids go on a fitness equipment, is it safe and things like that. But 
again, when, when, when my kids were really young, it was hard like to go on a playground. Yes, I love playing with my kids, but sometimes you want to do something different as well, where they are just engaged in this making like uh, sand, sand castles. And I was like, well, I did that now for 20 minutes. I'm a bit over with it, but they still have a ball there. And then I could be on a, on a bike, actually cycling and do something for myself and meet somebody else. There. So I think these are the opportunities we need to explore a little bit more. But I think in regards to public spaces, that's quite um, an interesting question there as well, where, where um, obviously we are more in the, in the field of parks and playgrounds, but um, in, in, in Europe, I think like all the public plazas, like when you go to Siena and stuff like that, it's, it's just beautiful. That's intergenerational. Kids are playing hacky sack and, and, and throwing the frisbee and then there's coffee shops next door. But somehow this vibe, I don't see that really here so much. Do you, Deb? Uh, no, not as much. But... Oh, anyway. oh, just an echo. Um, Tobias, you made a really good point about sort of different cultural differences. And Leanne's just suggested, she talked about Scotland fairy woods. So they've got country estates with miniature fairy doors and houses along walking paths. So kind of as, you know, engaging about, about walking. We don't really, we don't do that whimsy here very well in Australia. Does that make sense? I, I think that, and that's a nice idea because there's this other theory as well from Young Gill as well, like how we have every 30 seconds when we drive, something needs to grab our eyes to actually engage with. And I think that that's a great example. Like how do we do that with this human corridor? It's like if you meander, like what makes you doing, or do I jump in the car or actually do I walk? So for one, it needs to be safe. It needs to be nicely shaded so that I don't get burned here and, and get skin cancer. But then what are the other cues on the way oh wow that's this and oh who has like i always love it when i go to melbourne my brother-in-law they live in this beautiful little neighborhood in uh, morning peninsula and there's one guy he calls it the magic tree and every week he has different things on it and the kids love it they just want to go there every week to see what he has put on the magic tree but it gives you another little cue to why you want to go there so i think there are different ways where we can engage a little bit more like that that's great. And what about technology? Um, so some people will talk about using their phones and AR and, you know, playing a game with phones and um, gamification. Um, we don't do that very much either, actually. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think there was, um, well, I had this idea and I pitched it last year to the um, Heart Foundation. I called it Tales of the Hood. So my Tales idea was like, Tales of the Hood, like storytelling. Yep. Tales of the Hood. So, so the idea was, because um, I love park run. So people meet on a Saturday and they do the 5K run. That's great. But it's all, again, about physical education or physical things and good for my heart. But I thought it's not really um, connecting people and creating a stronger sense of community within our neighborhoods. So my idea was like to start like every first Saturday, um, you meet at a spot in my neighborhood, for example. And then one Saturday, my nine-year-old Noah does a walk. So he actually walks with the group through the neighborhood and tells us where he plays, where he's hiding stuff, where he's doing naughty, whatever the stories are. And then we record that. And I think Marcus Foss from QUT, he has developed this really cool app that actually can then capture the story. And if somebody else wants to hear Noah's story, he has to be at that spot at the exactly same time if we wanted to do that. And then they can walk the same walk that Noah did and they learn about Noah's experience in that neighborhood. Then the week or the months later, the 90 year old Peter does a walk. Oh, I grew up. So suddenly my kid meets Peter. So every time he's on the street, Peter knows Noah. So we create this whole idea of like, oh, we're safe and we have a purpose to come somewhere and not like, oh, that's awkward. Like, why is this 90-year-old talking to my nine-year-old? But now we actually had an opportunity to, to meet, connect, share stories, and then continue that. So that was an idea that I had that could be a really cool movement, Tales of the Hood. And then we share this. And you could go, let, let's say I go to, to Adelaide. I could download Tales of the Hood here. And then I find out about the community and meet people or whatever. So that was one idea I thought could be really cool to explore. Yeah, that's really cool. It is that whole, there's a whole conversation here about on the, on the chat about playable cities and streets as public spaces. And there's a whole lot of that digital interface. I'm just wondering if you guys think, oh, do you want to make a comment about tech? Uh, I just, um, yeah, I think actually we need to do more research. We need to do more programs and more research in that space because I think it's so new. And to really figure out um, how we can capitalize on the popularity of 
AR and VR and kids on, you know, playing games constantly and that kind of thing and actually get them out and exploring their environment and connecting with other people and those kinds of things. I think, um, yeah, I think, I think there's, it's really necessary because that's kind of the direction we're going in. Um, I, I found it as well when I was at the Mona, um, was, it was quite interesting because you got your headset and then you can actually stop at your own pace at different things and you find out more about the, the art pieces. So something like that, again, like it just gives another affordances, doesn't it? Like you could actually do your own virtual tour through Brisbane following like a virtual thing with your interests and pick where I want to skip or where I want to go. So again, I'm not a technology like I hardly can use my phone. I can do a phone call and check my emails. That's it. But but I think that's where the obviously the world is going. And and again, this research that we started up there on this gamification for this school, it's just like if we get the kids through an, a, a device to engage more with nature and understand nature more, and then take more ownership of nature. Well, that's where we want to be, don't we? Like we need to somehow. Um, close that gap rather than being uh, uh, totally living in this artificial world. So how do we get this artificial um, devices to connect with our real world? And I think, um, yeah, that's, as you said, more research needed, but then also technology to be then used for the good. Yeah, so they've done some work, I think, with like citizen science and um, trying to use technology to encourage um well not only young people but all all people all ages um to gather information about the environment and specific you know habitats or um species population kind of sightings that kind of thing so i think um there's lots of opportunity and yeah we just need to do more do more projects to figure it out now there's a question earlier, um, where is it? So I'm just trying to find it. Oh, about an object. Jim, do you want to talk about that? It's about Lime Scooters and I'm assuming the Lime Scooter introduction has been a bit controversial because first off, anyone who's like over the age of 30 basically falls off and breaks an arm or a wrist um, using them. That's probably one thing. But I think the bigger one, actually Jim, I'm not sure the point you're trying to make. There's a few things about safety for visual people with visual impairments or is it about connecting people? I'm not sure which element it's just about, I guess, objects in the urban environment and the role they play and how they change it, maybe? I don't know. Oh, I was... Oh, I was, oh okay. Yeah, I, was actually, I was actually referring to, like, um, you know, for young people, they active, if they use, like, a lime scooter, the whole city integrates, like, active play. And that's what I was thinking. You are a thousand percent correct. And I put my lens of um, age-friendly disability on that but actually you were saying lime scooters give teens freedom right so it's so important that we actually you know are aware of the bias that we bring yeah yeah i was just making a comment i was saying like lime scooter as an object it can like yeah making this whole city playable like yeah like, you're right it's like to ride on lime scooter just explore the city correct um I don't know, is anyone, oh, there's a new message that we scroll down. Oh, yep, yeah, uh, someone clearly was just saying that, um, oh, I didn't know this, Adelaide City Council, she thinks using Minecraft as an engagement tool to get students to design their desires for a national park. Actually, that's interesting. Are we engaging the youth enough in the co-design and the design of our facilities, um, you know, in terms of our playgrounds and our cities and our streets? Are we doing that enough, Toby and Deb? Well, I think um, that's a really good point. I think the voices of children are not really heard. Like a lot of times we, as the adult and as the professions take on that head and go like, oh, we know what our kids want, but it's not really getting them engaged. And I don't think using the best tools to really get them properly engaged. Like a lot of times I find we still do we do a design and then it goes out to public consultation. Then I, like you can more or less say yes, like it or don't like it. And then there's like two or three options, but it's not really engaging them in the early concepts and, and what makes them tick and actually understand what they see in, in, in the neighborhood. So again, what, what you just mentioned there before, Deb, as well, and you're about this um, growing up in cities. So obviously that's looking at um, photo voices and like there are so many different um, participation methods that could be used that are not really used. And I think for one, obviously comes back to budgets. 
it comes back to time frames. But I think um, again to nearly have like a like a youth uh, youth parliament or something like that that are really more engaged with it. That that's probably that or it is definitely a missing link. So to, to really give them a voice to be part of that um, city making. Yeah, I think um, certain countries do it really well. Um, like Scotland has um, does a lot with their youth parliament and kind of youth at decision making level. Um, but then, yeah, the growing up in cities and that that's international. So there's a lot of programs. But I was part of um, we started growing up Boulder, which was um, in Boulder, Colorado. And so and it's still going, actually. I think it's one of the longest running growing up in cities programs. But um, yeah, it's really about encouraging kids to get involved and meeting them where they're at. So not expecting them to sort of come to a council meeting, although some did, but um, it's actually going into the schools or going into, you know, the youth centers or going wherever they are and actually doing the activities that are interesting for them to get um, their voice heard in the decision making. But you really have to have a council or a decision-making body that um, will listen. <laughs> so I think like that sometimes the missing piece, I mean, but uh, like Tobias said, uh, oftentimes it comes down to time and resources and things like that, which is just, you know, that, that's unfortunate. And I think sometimes with the community consultations where there are two ways, like when you do it properly, then sometimes it takes too long. And then as you said, the, the, the risk is as well that they have already a vision in the head and they just do it but then they don't listen then we actually burn resources because the people that got burned once they will next time go like nah I'm not wasting all my Saturdays again to come there to give all my ideas and nobody even listens anyway yeah. or it takes too long so you actually go through and then yeah it's another master plan and another master plan and then it takes like five years and then nothing from the first master plan where I was involved in actually came through because it was like changes so it's, it's a tricky one but I think it's definitely something again um, to look at and to improve that's right that's its levels of uh, you know public engagement from you know you know participation engagement and decision making okay there's heaps of really good questions tristan's is actually a really good point about we need to focus more on designing playgrounds for diverse neighborhoods in lower socioeconomic areas where kids and parents don't have much money you know and often they don't have much transport either he doesn't say this but i do you know do you know what i mean so that how can we do that like how can we design better playgrounds for our most, I guess, our most vulnerable citizens? That's a good question. And then, I don't think we can answer that, but we can think about it. And then the, another good question is AR, so augmented reality. If you've developed such things, how do you commercialize it? Who are the main clients? Is it councils and how would you approach them? Well, one with the, one with the challenging neighborhoods, I think, um, again, the perception is sometimes out there like, oh, because it's a changing neighborhood, they will vandalize it and things like that. So I think it's, again, a bad perception out there. But again, when we engage early, and um, we, we did that in Nembo, like this playground got burned all the time, and then actually working with the community, and now they take ownership of it. It's, it's with everything. The more you get the people involved, then it goes back to your theories, really, isn't it? Then you, you have an um, attachment to that place, and then you wouldn't burn it. And then if you, sometimes it's little things that, the tree planting could be done by the community. So they go like, oh no, I really planted this tree. So they take ownership of that. And if somebody comes and actually starts to do the wrong thing, they actually police it themselves. But I think that's, that's the challenge where exactly these developments and these neighborhoods, as that question was raised, they need it more than anybody else. So that's where they're living in small apartments a lot of times where they don't have a lot of like um, green space, open space. So for these communities, we have to make sure they have a lot of greenery around them to take the stress away, to have a lot of blue, blue spaces around them, to have a lot of um, spill out spaces where you can just lose yourself, but also having this idea of prospect refuge where there's a space where I can just be by myself and then I can engage with others. So it's even more important to have a truly seven sense and sensory engaged, I guess, landscape throughout this entire development than anywhere else. I think that's really the key thing. And that would create then a nicer environment for them. And that would create a better neighborhood. So we actually, it's a win-win. So the more, but that's the problem. Like a lot of times we don't have the money to invest into this area. So it's really coming again to politics to make sure that they invest the right money to make that happen for these communities and engage them early. Actually, uh, Toby, I put a link in the chat. One of my favorite projects um, 
called Mural Art or the Port White Program in America. And they, they do the paint murals, but they work with the community and they co-design and co-paint the mural on usually on topics like homelessness or mental health awareness. And so it's all about that, yeah, collaborative placemaking where the local community is really involved in putting their voice on, on the space. And it's really beautiful work. Okay, there's a tree and look, this is like everyone, yeah, we all want to make a positive difference actually. So there's some question here, how do we, yeah, true, Leanne, how do we get, find something for parents to do at parks. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of things for kids to do at parks, but how can we make parks exciting destinations for parents, not just exercise equipment? She didn't say that, I'm saying that. Deb, Tobias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the focus, the project that um, Tobias and I are working on together right now is about intergenerational park design. So hopefully eventually we'll have guidelines, but it's, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very, very important um, consideration that we actually need to look more into. And I also agree, I, there was a comment about, um, you know, with kind of low income neighborhoods and developing park space, but we actually have to think about some of those other factors like the independent mobility and whether or not kids can get there easily. Um, and if it's a safe neighborhood to even walk through and, you know, there's so many other factors, but I think that the, um, the photos that I showed from our PhD student in Indonesia is a, it's a good example because that's like incredible, like high, high use. Um, it's a low income neighborhood, um, but public spaces that were provided by the government. Um, okay, there's heaps of comments on that. It's all too hard for me to monitor and, and respond to. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to the AR project. That's a good question. Who pays for, if we know, if we think that augmented reality and, to, and integrating the, digi the digital and the physical is a way to activate park spaces, is who, who does pay for that? Should we be build, including that into the budgets when we design parks? And then who, who pays for the, you know, the long-term tech or is this a public engagement? Like, yeah. Does it make sense? Who who could create and support the creation of of these kind of you know technology enabled experiences? Well, big, big data is such a big thing. So I think um, for council, it's fantastic. Like I, I think council should invest into that because then they like there's nothing more valuable than having big data. And again, that would help us with all our research backup then as well. So through that, we would know the usage, like who is actually using this new fitness thing or this new mindfulness walk that engages not just fitness but it's actually in a park the secondary tertiary pathways who engages different facilities within or assets within um, the council asset plan and then again how good is that if you can really over then 10 years time rather than replacing correct well look our usage wasn't there really so yeah. it's um, yeah. it has such a will be massive investment but i think the cost benefit analysis would be would be quite positive so i i i i don't know who else would pay for it i think it's probably needs to be council yep. yeah i i agree i think it depends on the the purpose of the ar vr program so if it can be something where they're collecting data or um like the citizen science kind of idea um, otherwise it's just probably going to have to be commercialized and uh, independent or you know um, business or organization would have to fund it. I mean, we've looked at that, um, again, another project, well, that Tobias had mentioned that we did together um, last year. And that was actually one of the roadblocks of doing it is because at the university level, it's hard to kind of continuously have funding to, um, to support, like to create and then support an ongoing AR, VR program or game. And so, yeah, I think that um, becomes kind of the question of how do we continue it in the long term. I mean, in some ways it's your, it could be your local businesses um, or the big business. So I've just put a link into a, it's a UK project called Beatbox and um, they wanted to encourage people to walk and cycle to school. So they gave them a thing where they could tag on and off. Um, I think it was, you know, like um, light, light, you know, lights and stuff. And each time you tag past it, you got a point. And so there's a lot of that gamification and technology um, going on. I'm conscious we're at three o'clock. I don't know if we want to go a few more minutes if you want to wrap up. What do you think, Deb? Uh, maybe let's just wrap up because it's, um, I mean, um, yeah, no, let's, let's wrap up. Okay. Hey, thanks everybody for coming. It was really great. We really appreciate it. Yes. We'll share the slides. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, thanks for, for rejoining us. Oh yeah. my God. Um, super. Yeah. Oh. Good to have you. Uh, so sorry. And can you please Thank come back next week? 
Yeah, come back next week. We were going to talk about age-friendly design, inclusive design and disability. Um, we will send you a new secret login and password. Um, what else do you have for Toby? Awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for Zooming in. Have a great yeah. day. And don't forget to send in your picture or bring back your picture next week for um, activating your front lawn. Or someone, yeah. someone, yeah, please, un 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 video your stuff. I mean, get a book. So yeah, you got to Please turn your videos on if you want to talk and have a combo as well, okay? Um, see you next Tuesday, 1.30. That's right, you win a prize if you make a great front yard. <laughs> <laughs>